Lord Jesus Christ, as you rose on that first Easter morn, rise within each of us that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we might be transformed into the disciples you call us to be. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Good morning. Yeah, it's still morning. Some of us have been here a long time. So uh, let's, let's try this out. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Okay, so we're going to try that one more time. Uh, it's the Lord is risen indeed. Choir got it because they've been here all morning. All right. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Here we go. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Wonderful. All right, here's something else. Can those of you in the balcony hear? Raise your hand if you cannot hear. If you cannot hear. Can, can you all hear? Great. All right, so we're off to a good start. Um, well, a, a while back, um, uh, my friend and our longtime member, uh, Tom Tellipson, lifetime member of this church, sent me a little joke in the mail and this is not an invitation to send me jokes in the mail. Just he sent me one. So, um, and so it seems the pastor was pretty revved up. Uh, it was going to preach a little bit longer than he normally did. Because that never happened here, but it was, it was Easter Sunday. So, but as he was bringing his sermon to a close, he saw one of his longtime members get up out of his pew, walk out the door. And this distressed the pastor so much that uh, after church, he called the man. He said, I, you know, I couldn't help noticing you. You got up and you left church right at the end of my sermon. Did I say something that offended you? Did I say something that bothered you? Heavens no, the old man said. I, I just realized I needed a haircut. I said, haircut, the preacher said. He said, yeah, you know. Could you not have done that before you came to church? He said, well, you know, honestly, I didn't need one when you began preaching. But uh, by the time you were finished, I, I did. There is some real temptation for a preacher to do too much on Easter Sunday. We know this is kind of the Super Bowl for the church, uh, the spiritual Super Bowl. It's the biggest, it's our biggest sale day of the year, you might say. We realize we might not get a chance like this again until Christmas Eve for some of you. Um, because I know some of you are visiting today and some have been maybe been away for a while. Some of you are here, I would say. Let's be honest, because you're, you're not quite sure what the resurrection story really means to you. And some of you might be here because you're, you're giving God a last shot. Uh, a preacher does not want to miss the opportunity to help connect the dots for any of you who might be like any of these. So here's a small request uh, for the next few minutes. For whatever reason you're here, uh, let me invite you to ponder with me, let's really dig into the resurrection story. One of the things I love about the Bible stories, and particularly those around our Lord Jesus, is it always, it seems like sometimes God always saves the best for last. I think when Mary got pregnant, you remember Joseph wanted to turn her out because of the embarrassment it would bring to his family. And that story turned out well. Lazarus was in his tomb for quite some time, and, and his sister thought, you know, that's it. Jesus didn't show up in time, and Jesus shows up, and that story turned out pretty well. And today, Jesus really does save the best for last. Before I go on, let me say, you know, my wife, Laura, will usually not let me go shopping for clothes on my own. Uh, I have absolutely no sense of fashion. I hate shopping. And one of the reasons she often comes is to talk me off the ledge when I want to abandon ship to my old comfortable clothes. But she's also there to remind me that with the passing of time, fashion also changes. My problem is if it were up to me, I'd end up looking like a 1970s John Travolta, kind of proudly strutting out my style in a suit, where, you know, kind of hearing in my mind the Bee Gees song, you can tell by the way I use my walk, you know, I would look very 70s. She's there to take my hand and show me a different way altogether. But you know, Jesus wants to do something similar for you and for me, though on a far different scale. He wants us to see beyond our day-to-day -day lives and our present and persistent circumstances. I would like to say he, he wants to give us Easter eyes, if you will. 
that everywhere we turn, we see not darkness, but light, not death, but life, not bloody crosses, but empty tombs. He wants to change our world as he did that first Easter morning. And it all begins with a simple, powerful image, a stone rolled over from the gospel lesson's first line. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. The stone rolled away is how this story ends and begins. Jesus is in the business of turning over stones, particularly those that might get in the way of allowing him to take hold of us. So I'm going to ask you to ponder this question. What stone might you bring today? Maybe it is doubt. You may be here today because you love the Easter story. You love that the drab darkness of Lent and Good Friday have been wiped away and the colors have returned now to the church. You may be saying, I do love all of this, the new hat, the seersucker suit, the new dress, the white bucks, but I'm not sure there's much for me beyond that and all of this. I mean, I wasn't there. I wasn't at the tomb. Our culture does that to, to, to some degree. Our culture is pretty much tumbled into a kind of Seinfeld-esque cynicism about the whole thing. And so for some, the core message of Easter has dwindled into metaphor and symbolism, perhaps even buying into what some modern scholars have identified as a nicely inspired legend. But it is not that, is it? Easter is not about winter slipping into spring. It's not supposed to just give us warm feelings. Ah, the cold weather has passed and the tulips are now breaking through the ground again. We know, we must know in our guts that there's so much more to it than that. Within the span of 24 hours, one event will capture the world's attention more than any other single moment in 2024. More than draft day, more than a selfie snap at the Oscars, more than the opening of a blockbuster film. Billions will gather today from every language, race, culture, the rich, the poor, and everything in between. Studies are actually showing that while there is some decrease in church attendance, this year it's estimated that a record number of Christians will gather around the globe for Christian worship, about 2.3 billion. Kings, paupers, politicians, and scholars of, on every continent of the globe. And they, as we do today, will recall and claim the central truth of the Christian story, which is the resurrection. What world history not church history, world history tells us, is that virtually every one of Jesus' apostles received martyrdom willingly, as did millions upon millions of others from the streets of ancient Jerusalem and Rome to those of Egypt and Nigeria and Russia and China today in our own day. And they do so not for a legend. They've done so in masses too large to number because they know Christ has died and they know Christ has risen. Give God your stone of doubt. He will turn it over and transform your skepticism into hope. Some of you, some of you may find the Easter story being held at arm's length by a stone of your own sin. But Easter can turn that stone over too. You've done something. You've hurt someone. Maybe someone you came to church with today. You feel like a marked man or marked woman. A big fat scarlet S is painted on your head and you've begun to feel like, what's the use? Just leave it alone. Just leave all that behind. Just leave the stone in place. Not too long ago, I, I had somebody tell me this. He said, you know, I can pretty much sum up the gospel in one sentence. And I, I'll be honest, I, I, I thought, here I am. I've, I've had six years of theological education under my belt. I'm, I'm ready to take him on. And so I said, okay, uh, give it a try. And he said, well, we messed up and God came and fixed it. I've heard worse. And it kind of made me want to get my money back for those six years of theological training. Easter is not for the saintly. It's for the sinner. You know, one reason the angel told that the women who come to the garden to not be afraid, because if the stone was turned over, it meant, you know, Jesus was alive, and he was about to 
catch them red-handed, maybe they felt. They were carrying spices for a dead man, not cologne for a living one, but he said, I see that in your hands. Don't be afraid. In the Matthew version of the story, the angel says, don't be afraid. He is not here. He has been raised. And then he says this, go to Galilee and tell the others. And what is he going to go to Galilee to do? To kick some apostolic tail for all their doubting and fear and betrayal? No, he's going to tell them that he came to do away with all of that, to put all of that to death as well. Who is one of the first peop people that Jesus sought to find? Peter. Can you imagine when word gets to Peter, Jesus wants to see you about what happened the other night. He probably thinks, not me, can't be me, doesn't want to talk to me, not after what I've done. That may be you today. I'm willing to tolerate Easter until this service is over, but I just assume keep this bag of stones that weigh me down. There's no way God can forgive me, not after what I've done, not a chance. The Easter story writes in big, bold letters, we messed up and God came and fixed it. I love the words of Corey ten Boom, there is no pit so deep that Christ is not deeper still. To be honest, you know what Jesus probably expects from most of us? Not success, but failure. It's not that he does not take delight when you succeed, but, but when you don't, and when you come to terms with it, when you come to realize your own sin, that's probably when God says to himself, now I can really do something with that child of mine. Hand him the stone of your sin. Hand him the stone of your guilt, and he will turn it over erasing it by his divine mercy and forgiveness. Another stone some of you may be carrying today is your suffering. You know, suffering can come in all kinds of forms. Physical may be the first that comes to mind, but there's emotional suffering, there's mental suffering, there's spiritual suffering as well. You probably know someone like that. Maybe you're somebody like that. Folk like that, rather than defining, allowing God to define who they are, they sometimes define themselves by their illness or their divorce or some failure from years gone by. But doing that kind of thing negates all those great promises of God to be with us in our suffering. Sometimes, of course, God does deliver us from suffering. But more often than not, he delivers us in our suffering. What does the psalm read? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. Some of you may know the name Joni Erickson Tata. At age 17, her life changed dramatically when she dove into a shallow lake and suffered a spinal cord fracture that left her paralyzed from the neck down without the use of her hands and legs. Lying in a hospital bed, she tried desperately to make sense of the horrible turn of events. She actually begged friends to assist her in her suicide, anything to end her misery. She says she believed in God, but she was so angry with God. How could this circumstance be a demonstration of his love and his power? Surely he could have stopped this from happening. How could permanent lifelong paralysis be part of his loving plan? But a good friend of Joni pointed her to Christ. He reminded her that Christ suffered and pointed her to the promises of Christ's companionship and that suffering. In time, Jesus would in fact turn over the stone of Joni's suffering. This is what she writes. These are her words. Now, she says, God has used my accident to help turn a stubborn kid into a grown woman. My wheelchair used to symbolize alienation and confinement, but God has changed its meaning because I have trusted in him. Now my wheelchair symbolizes independence. It's a choice I made and one that anyone can make. I used to think happiness was a Friday night date and a size 12 dress, and a future with Ethan Allen furniture and 2.5 children. Now I know better. What matters is love. 
Joni has gone on in her Christian life to become an accomplished painter. I encourage you, if you get on the internet this afternoon, to look her up and you'll see the incredible works of art she carries out using a paintbrush with her lips. Only God can take suffering stones and refine them to be beautiful jewels. So give God your stone of suffering and he'll turn it over in ways that it cannot just be endured, but be transformed. So then, as God's power turned that stone away from Jesus' tomb, he wishes to turn over all your stones as well. Stones of doubt, of sin, of suffering, of all those things that weigh life down. He wants to refine them. He wants to redefine them as an alchemist turns coal to diamond or lead to gold. Perhaps nowhere is this more clear to us than in the ultimate victory of Easter, life over death. That's a stone that is hard for some to turn over, but without it, Easter has no meaning at all. Perhaps that's why our story today actually opens with this stone rolled away. And some of you will remember before that stone rolls away in another of the Gospels, there's actually an earthquake. I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake. I have actually been in three in my lifetime. Don't stand too close to me. And when it happened, it not only kind of shook me up, but it shook my senses a little bit, reminding me that there is an unseen world at work beneath me. Jesus wants to shake us out of our mournful stupors when it comes to pondering the mystery of death. He wants to remind us there is an unseen world beyond this one, one that is more real than ours. Some of us are here today, some of you virtually watching, and you're missing a loved one who died in the last year, or maybe many years ago. Some of us here today are afraid as death looms ever closer. Stones of grief and stones of fear. But the most significant message of Easter is, he is risen. What does that mean for us in the end? Let me go back to Joni Erickson Tada for just a moment. She's made no secret that Though Christ has been a close companion in her suffering, there have been times of great darkness and suffering in her life. And one of those actually traveled right along with her into her Episcopal church on an Easter morning some years ago, carrying a stone of deep depression along. She came into church hoping, no doubt, something said or sung or done in the service would turn her life around. And she heard, as we heard John pray moments ago, this opening collect, this opening prayer assigned for Easter Sunday. Almighty God, who through thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, has overcome death and opened unto us the gate of everlasting life, Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by the life-giving spirit through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as she heard those words, they sank beyond ear down to heart, and she began to weep. She began to have a vision of what rests beyond the grave. She says that she suddenly realized that when life is over and she arrives at the wedding banquet of the Lamb of God, that she will first fall down on her knees before Jesus. And then she says in her words, I will stand on my own two feet, freed from that wheelchair, released from the paralysis of arms and legs, and I will dance. Oh, indeed, as Paul writes, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where is your sting? In Christ, it is nowhere to be found. So let me circle back to where I began this Easter morning. What stones might you bring here today? Doubt? Sin? Suffering some form of death? A dying marriage? A dead-end job, a habit that holds you underwater so long you no longer know how to breathe, 
maybe death itself. But you know, these are just stones. They are lifeless. And God doesn't want you to live with any of them. My mentor, the late John Claypool, used to like to say, the last things are not always the worst things, especially when you place them in the hands of the risen one. Indeed, in the hands of the risen one, he always has the last laugh, and he always turns it around and offers resurrection. So all that I'm asking you to consider today is to give your stones to him. He wants you to leave here today with no stone unturned. He wants to take your life and turn it upside down so that the only thing your eyes can see in any direction is life and more life and more life indeed. Even when death has done its job, there is more life to be had, life eternal, because God always saves the best for last. And so, as on the first day of the week when Mary came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the tomb, as Matthew puts it, they left with fear and great joy. And at that moment, Jesus met them and said, greetings, do not be afraid. Go and tell the stone has turned. God reigns. Jesus lives. Life wins. Our brothers and sisters, alleluia, Christ is risen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. You can take that to the bank. Amen.